Hello, didn't see you there. I was just reading about eating disorders, specifically anorexia nervosa. Ever heard of it? You probably have. It affects nearly one million American women in their lifetime. Men can also be affected, but 75% of cases are female. It is a serious problem, but it is treatable. Hi, I'm Jamie Prisco, a student at the University of Central Oklahoma in the Counseling Psychology Program. For the next half hour, I'll be taking you through the twists and turns of anorexia nervosa. What is it? Where does it come from? How do we treat it? And what tools do we use in treatment? For most of us, eating is an enjoyable and everyday part of our life. But for people with anorexia nervosa, it's a bit of a different story. Let's head on over to the Education Building to learn some more information. I've been expecting you. Thanks for joining me. We're in a classroom now because we were going to be learning a little bit more about anorexia nervosa. First fact, the term anorexia comes from the Greek term for without appetite. Bam, you've just learned something. Second fact, the development of anorexia usually takes place between the ages of 13 and 14 and then again at 18 to 20. I wonder what those ages have in common. Anorexia usually begins with the person restricting their diet, with these restrictions becoming more and more complex over time. It is not a pretty picture. Most deaths that come from anorexia nervosa result from medical complications from malnutrition, and one in five of deaths result from suicide. And treatment is rather difficult. Between 10 and 20% of all cases are unremitted, and there are high dropout rates and high relapse rates. But for those who do make it through, treatment and recovery is possible. By now you're probably asking yourself, what are the diagnostic criteria for anorexia nervosa? And I'm glad that you asked. Fortunately, I happen to carry a DSM 5th edition on my person at all times. To be diagnosed with anorexia, a person must show a restriction of energy intake leading to body weight that is less than normal or expected, a fear of gaining weight or persistent behavior that prevents weight gain, and a disturbance in perception of body shape or weight, undue influence of body weight on self-evaluation, and the persistent denial of the seriousness of their low body weight. You can also specify partial or full remission, current severity, and the type, which is restricting or binging and purging. I'm putting on this lab coat now because we're gonna start talking about some serious science. And it's also a little bit chilly. I'm going to start with the etiology, science word, of anorexia. Most people, myself included, have adapted a sort of sociocultural idea behind anorexia nervosa, where we imagine an individual who has a thin ideal of what their body is supposed to look like. And this leads to high levels of body dissatisfaction and stricter and stricter levels of dieting. It turns out this is more applicable to bulimia nervosa. Anorexia nervosa is consistent and prevalent across all cultures, despite there being different ideas of beauty in different parts of the world, whereas bulimia nervosa is actually more prevalent in Western culture. People with anorexia show a dysregulation of areas of their brain that control appetite, emotionality, and cognitive control. In addition, people with anorexia just seem to find food less rewarding. If only. Anyway, it sounds nice, but it's actually a minefield because we as humans need food to survive. And to combine that with poor emotional processing, a higher attention to detail, and an overall rigidity in reasoning and behavior, and you have yourself a serious recipe for an eating disorder. No pun intended. It seems that the secret ingredients, ugh, the catalyst for developing anorexia is stress. Remember when I told you about those age ranges of 13 to 14 and 18 to 20? 
What could possibly be happening during those two age ranges that would inspire so much stress? Puberty, adulthood, college. By now, you're probably asking yourself if this is so biologically based, and why not just prescribe a pill and send them on their way? Why therapy? And to that, I say hello to all the pharmaceutical tycoons out there that are watching this presentation. I hope you're enjoying it. Um, there are some biological factors that do contribute to anorexia nervosa, but there are also cognitive factors as well. One's beliefs and culture doesn't single-handedly cause anorexia, but it can contribute to the severity and the complications of it. People with anorexia have an over-evaluation of their shape and weight, and their own ideas of their self-worth comes from their abilities to control their shape and weight. They fear being fat or even the sensations of feeling fat, which means that over time they start developing these dieting and eating restrictions with no real weight goal in mind. Before the fun begins, I want to show you this chart because a picture is worth a thousand words. It's from the work of Christopher Fairburn, a professor of psychiatry at Oxford, so you know it's legit. As you can see, the initial overvaluation of shape and weight leads to weight control behaviors which bring on the life-threatening consequences of under-eating. Each of these stages is influenced by a preoccupation with eating, social withdrawal, heightened fullness, and heightened obsessionality. What this means is that the person is always thinking about eating, easily feels full, and likely socially isolated outside of a support structure. There are three main treatment options. There is the family-based method in which parents take control over the planning and scheduling of meals, and this gradually restores control back to the child. There's also psychosocial issues that get addressed as well, like peer groups. It involves 15 to 20 sessions over a six to 12 month period of time, and there's decent research to support it. There is traditional CBT, which does well with bulimia nervosa, but more research needs to be done on its effects with anorexia nervosa. According to the APA Division 12, there is moderate research support for CBT. Finally, there is enhanced CBT, also known as CBTE, and it's got good support behind it. It's enhanced because it incorporates new strategies as well as addressing problems outside of the eating disorder. It comes in broad and focused varieties known as CBTEB and CBTEF. And there's no word on CBTEFG quite yet. Now we're going to talk a bit about some research surrounding CBT for anorexia nervosa. Don't worry, it's still Jamie. I'm just giving you a break from looking at my wonderful face because I want to be able to show you some things. We need to remember that CBT and CBTE are different treatment packages, and that CBTE was developed in part to address shortcomings in the traditional CBT approach. As you can see from this slide, there is a dearth of research on this topic, with most of the research being done on the family-based approach. For a fun drinking game, find a bunch of articles looking at CBT and anorexia. Read them, and then take a drink every time it says more research is needed, do not do this with hard liquor. You will die. What we mostly find is that CBT does have an effect, although the evidence is not as consistent as we would like it to be. CBT may help decrease shape and weight concerns, which can help with those evaluation priorities. When compared to the family-based treatment, CBTE presents an option for a cost-effective alternative, which would open treatment to a greater number of individuals. Some of the most interesting research looks at the practicality of the treatment. One key component is the therapeutic alliance, and many therapists are taught that developing a strong alliance with the client is key to a positive treatment outcome. Research suggests that this may not be the case. A strong alliance may itself be a product of positive outcomes. For the client with anorexia, it seems that weight gains early in the treatment lead to a stronger alliance later in treatment, not the other way around. This indicates that the therapist needs to focus more on changing the client's behavior than on a close relationship. In some cases, the close relationship may be a product of poor therapy. Think about it. Therapy is about change. Change is difficult. Clients won't like a therapist that really pushes them to change. But if a therapist allows the client to continue in their current maladaptive cycle of behavior, the difficulty is removed and the therapist will be seen in a more positive light. As you can see, 
there seem to be several predictors of better outcomes. So a client that is young, employed, has friends, and has only recently developed a problem is the ideal candidate. What can happen, and I know that you would never do this, but other therapists can begin to feel uncomfortable when results are not quickly forthcoming. To combat this anxiety, they begin to reduce the demands they are making on the client. Now, being flexible in your application of research is vital. Simply removing parts of the treatment package results in distortion, which is the death of treatment integrity. Other therapists, never you, of course, can water down their CBT or CBTE so much that it becomes CBTH, Homeopathic Cognitive Behavior Therapy. So what can be done? Several things. Keep track of the evidence behind what you are doing. It helps to read and use treatment manuals, as these give you the research behind the treatment, as well as show you how to apply it. Don't forget to do the basics. Having clients weigh in and keep track of what they're eating. Don't be afraid to be boring. Treatment takes time, and progress is slow, and sometimes clients get frustrated and non-cooperative. Unless the client's health places them in immediate danger, in which case they should be in a hospital, you have time to follow the plan. Remember that motivation is a continuous process. You can't just pump up the client during the first session and then expect it to carry through. Finally, always review what your client has or has not accomplished. This reinforces their behavior in addition to providing important information. Here are a few recommended treatment manuals. Most of what we are discussing now comes from the Fairburn, Cooper, Shafran, and Wilson chapter. The Dolly Grove and Fairburn books each offer ways to specifically address children and adolescents. Now we're going to learn about the CBTE treatment protocol. I've taken off my lab coat because I'm no longer cold. Not because we're not still doing science. Therapy is science. Like any science. Science rules! Anyway, it contains four main stages, which includes psychoeducation, getting control on eating, getting control on thinking, and then relapse prevention. Before treatment starts, there will be an initial evaluation interview, and this takes place about two hours long. And there are four main goals in this interview. The first is to engage the client and prepare them for change. The second is to assess the nature and severity of the patient's current psychopathology. The third is to jointly create a formulation with the client to engage them in the treatment. And the fourth is to establish real-time self-monitoring. You'll also measure their height and weight and administer the Eating Disorder Examination Questionnaire, the EDEQ, and the Clinical Impairment Assessment, also known as the CIA. The first stage of treatment lasts four weeks with two appointments each week. And here is where we begin to establish collaborative weighing. And there is a sense of anxiety that is to be expected um, during this time of weighing, and that's okay. It also allows the patient to see changes happening in real time. And it allows the therapist to be there with the client when they're having these anxious feelings. And it helps to address any body checking or weight checking habits that they may have. The last step is to graph their weight and learn more about the BMI. During these beginning sessions, there is a bit of psychoeducation involved in why it's important to eat healthy and establish healthy eating habits. By session three, they will establish a normal pattern of regular eating. The client is instructed to eat at regular intervals three times a day with two snacks a day, and their eating should be limited to these meals. Establishing this regular eating pattern does require some negotiation between the client and the therapist. The client should be allowed to choose what they eat, and they should not feel under pressure to eat anything. At this point, the pattern of them eating every single day is more important than the content of what they are choosing to eat. And this new eating pattern should be incorporated into their daily schedule. They should be able to plan ahead for their meals and snacks with no more than four hours in between each meal. They shouldn't feel pressured or going out of their way to eat these meals. It should be easy for them to access them. Since there are some levels of anxiety to be expected at this point, this intervention should be developed in stages. And there should also be troubleshooting measures taken if at any point the client finds difficulty in going through the scheduled eating. 
It is also important in CBTE for children and adolescents to include significant others, whether this be parents or grandparents or siblings. And this is so that everyone can work together to help the patient with change. In some cases, there may be someone in the child or adolescent's life that is making change difficult, and those issues need to be addressed. And sessions with the parents and significant others usually takes place over a 45 minute time period after a routine session. Sessions 9 and 10 represent a transitional period in treatment. And this is where a joint review of progress takes place during these sessions. We administer the EDEQ and the CIA as well as a measure of general psychiatric health. You also monitor any graphs or records that have been made throughout the first few sessions as well as client compliance up to this point. Typically at this stage of treatment, clients will have seen an improvement in their eating patterns, but there will still be worries about their body image that will have not have changed. During this transition period of treatment, you'll begin to start revising the formulation if any problems have come up along the way. And the changes in the formulation are based off of observations made during the first stage of treatment. This is also a time to properly address any problems that the client has encountered along the way and troubleshoot those problems. And this is also where we start to design a third stage of treatment, which is our main stage. This is where the treatment becomes highly individualized for the client. Sessions 11 through 17 represent the main part of treatment. And here is where we start to identify the key mechanisms that have been in place that have been maintaining the eating disorder so far. And some of these include an over-evaluation of shape and weight, an over-evaluation of control over eating, dietary restraint, event and mood related changes in eating, dietary restriction, and being underweight. And the order of how these mechanisms are addressed and treated is based on the client's current psychopathology. In order to address their over-evaluation of shape and weight, it's important to understand that the client judges their own self-worth based on their shape and weight and their ability to control them. And clinical research suggests that this is a major obstacle in the treatment of eating disorders and needs to be overcome in order to minimize the chance of relapse. And there are five aspects to this process identifying over-evaluation and its consequences, developing self-evaluative domains, addressing body checking, addressing body avoidance, and encountering the feelings of feeling fat. Most people judge themselves on a basis of meeting personal standards. And so you'll have the client generate a list of ideas that make a contribution to his or her own self-evaluation. And in here, most likely will include aspects about their appearance or controlling their eating habits. You'll rank these items and then you'll put them into a pie chart, which consider the implications of the self-evaluation and the consequences of it as well. And you'll work to develop new domains and reduce the importance of the domains that center around shape and weight. In order to change these domains of self-evaluation, it's important to increase the importance of other domains and reduce the shape and weight domain. So you do this by increasing the number of other domains and you'll explain the rationale of why it's important to have other domains added to the list. Help the client identify new and exciting and engaging activities to try. Ask them things that they've always wanted to do that they never have or things they used to do but they don't do anymore. And try and encourage them to get back into those activities in their regular routine and ensure that the client actually tries these new activities and check in on their progress and see how they feel once they've started new things. The next goal is to address body checking and provide information about the behavior itself and its consequences and find out what behaviors they're actually engaging in and explain to them a certain level of body checking is normal, such as looking in a mirror or checking their weight occasionally and just making sure it's not taking up all of their day and discuss ways in which checking or avoiding become unusual. Some unusual body checking behaviors include measuring the dimensions of their body, as well as photographing parts of their body at different times of the day. And then try and increase these normative forms of body checking and decrease the unusual forms of body checking. Another topic that you'll be addressing is body avoidance. And in this, exposure is key. Help the patient get used to how their body looks and dressing and undressing in the dark should be phased out. And gradually abandon their use of baggy and shape disguising clothing and even get them to participate in activities that involve a certain degree of exposure like swimming and then establish a normative risk free form of body checking and weight checking. Another thing that you'll do is address feeling fat 
and explain to them that feeling fat is not the same thing as being fat and record the times when the client experiences these feelings of fatness and have the client ask themselves two questions. What has happened in the last hour to trigger this feeling and what am I feeling now? And examine any mood states or physical sensations that heighten body awareness. Are they feeling bored, depressed, or lonely? Do they feel full? Are they wearing clothing that feels too tight? And then start engaging them in some problem solving tactics. Another thing that you'll do is address dietary restraint and food avoidance. Start this by reducing or eliminating the strong need to diet and then identify what dietary restraints that they have in place. When, how much, what types of food, and what is motivating these restraints? And what are the consequences for breaking these rules they set up for themselves? What's the worst thing that could happen? And plan how to effectively break these rules. And analyze the implications of it as well. And discuss with the patient why their dieting is a problem. And special care should also be taken for clients who binge eat. Another thing that you'll address is event and mood related changes in eating. Are they using binge eating or vomiting or both to cope with negative events or bad moods that they're experiencing? Are they eating less or stopping eating altogether to gain a sense of control in their lives? Are they eating less to influence others as an act of defiance or a way to exhibit stress? And discuss the events and moods that appear to contribute to the maintenance of these activities. And teach proper coping skills and proactive problem solving. The next stage, stage four, is the last stage of treatment and it's sessions 18 to 20, which consists of three sessions over five weeks. And here you're going to ensure that the changes have been made are maintained. You want to review the client's progress in detail and any remaining problems that they may be having. You'll re-administer the EDEQ and the CIA again, and then you'll also develop a short-term plan that spans over 20 weeks. And you'll also want to minimize the risk of future relapse. So you're going to educate the client about the risk of relapse and stress the importance of detecting any problems that they're having early and constructing a plan of action and discuss when the client should seek help. 20 weeks after treatment concludes, there's a post-treatment review where you reassess the client's state and need for future treatment. There may also be a need for brief sessions that address any setbacks that the client has experienced along the way. You'll also review the implementation of their short-term plan and expand it out to a long-term plan and discuss how these setbacks may be overcome. And then you'll also review long-term maintenance of the plans that have been put in place. Finally, while this treatment program was originally adapted for adults, it can actually be easily adapted for children and adolescents. There's an individualized approach to this therapy, which means it's easy to change from person to person. And also, children love control and autonomy and feeling like they're doing things on their own. And there are also multiple strategies that can be used as well. There are also some distinctive needs that need to be addressed. A higher proportion of teens report that over-evaluation of eating control that we discussed, and not the other factors as well. And adolescents usually receive an eating disorder, not otherwise specified diagnosis. There's also an egocentric nature of the eating problem, which relates to the values and feelings that relate to their overall self-image, and also how weight loss is a primary goal. It's also reinforced by social factors, such as the people that they see every single day. And they start to form a sort of anorexic identity, which means that the client and the illness become one, and it's hard to see one without the other. It's also been seen as an attempt to attract absent parents, which means that they've tried and tried to tell their parents that they don't feel okay, and now they're going to show their parents how they don't feel okay. There's also severe medical complications such as osteopenia and osteoporosis, which is a loss of bone mass. There's also growth arrest and a delayed or absent puberty. Puberty! There's also psychosocial issues that need to be addressed as well versus regarding their sense of identity, their independence, their interpersonal relationships, and how they're adjusting to the changes in puberty. Puberty, 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 puberty. When seeing the adolescent or the child for the first time, see them by themselves, without their parents or other guardians. Listen to their thoughts and issues on treatment. The important question to ask is, did they come freely? and emphasize that you're working on their behalf and get their consent to work alone as well with their parents. One of the tools that you'll be using in treatment is a food log, and it's pretty self-explanatory. You'll have the client write down the time that they ate, what they ate, 
the place that they ate, and then the context or the comment of what they ate. So what are they feeling when they're eating the food? There's also a little star, which indicates if it felt excessive for them, as well as a lowercase p, which represents purging. And this is useful for a couple of different reasons for the client as well as the therapist. It establishes the patterns of eating throughout the day, the content of what they're eating, as well as when do they actually eat throughout the day. Another tool that you'll be using is the EDEQ, which is a list of 28 questions. That some of these questions are on a Likert scale setup, while some others are asked for some direct answers. Once the client has finished the EDEQ, you will score it. Um, the EDEQ generates both frequency data on key behaviors, which is questions 13 through 18, as well as subscale scores that reflect current psychopathology and its severity. Each subscale score is an average. To obtain a subscale score, add the ratings of the questions that make up the subscale and then divide by the number of questions in the scale. A score can be dividing the total score by the number of rated items as long as more than half of the items are rated. A global score is obtained by adding the subscale scores together and dividing by four. And once these scores are obtained, you'll compare them to the norms. The CIA is a 16-item self-report measure that asks questions such as, over the past 28 days, to what extent have your eating habits, exercising, or feelings about your shape, eating, or weight made it difficult for you to concentrate, made you upset, made you feel guilty, or made you feel absent-minded? You'll have the client place an X on the column that best describes how frequently they have experienced these statements. And they range from not at all, a little, quite a bit, or a lot. To score the CIA, each column has a multiplier. The multiplier for not at all is zero, a little, one, quite a bit, two, and a lot is three. You'll add up the numbers of X's in each column and then multiply by the appropriate number. For example, let's say you have six X's in the not at all column. So do six times zero, which equals zero. Once you have totals for each column, you'll add up all the scores for your grand total. The CIA ranges from zero to 48. The higher the score, the greater likelihood for psychopathology. Any questions? Just kidding. I know you can't ask questions through the video, at least not with today's technology. I'm glad you joined us and thank you for watching. Now I'm going to go get something to eat because all this talk about eating and food has made me really hungry. Bye. Hi, I'm Jamie Prisco, a graduate student at the UCO Count Hall. Oh, start over. <laughs> it is treatable, but dip. Mm. At this point, you're probably asking yourself, but what are the diagnostic Diagnostic. You can also assess current or low. What am I saying? Bulimia. Anorexia. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to say. Hang on, I have to figure out what I'm saying. <laughs> the CIA is a 16... How did I mess up already? By now you're probably asking yourself, but what are the diagnostic criteria for anorexia nervosa? I'm laughing. Just Sorry, kidding. now I'm laughing. Right. Bam, bam, bam. That's going to be fun. Do you want me to start shouting puberty just, now? You can just keep all right, now go to uh, puberty. <laughs> this is so strange. Okay. <laughs> what should my hand be for puberty? Whatever hand gesture most symbolizes puberty for you. 100% <laughs> go for that. We'll just do puberty. God, that's so awkward. <laughs> okay. Puberty, adulthood, college, grad school. You just want me to shout puberty? Yeah. Six to twelve month period. I have a nose itch. So social issues that get addressed as well, like peer groups. This sort of <laughs> it's got good support behind it. It's in uh, I'm just gonna start from enhanced. It's enhanced because it incorporates Matthew. <laughs>
<laughs> Most people who die from anorexia, I probably shouldn't say die, is becoming more and more severe over time. It is not a pretty picture. Matthew? I'm happy. You did a good job. Can you move that way? Matthew! Stop making people laugh. I've been expecting you. It's not a declaration. It is. It's a time. I've been expecting you. I've been expecting you. Yeah, it's not expecting. Expect, expecting. Right, yeah. Can I do the nose? Like, show your chin. The nose has nothing to do with questioning. Sometimes you ponder with your nose. You're pondering with your nose.